At Kroger, no matter where you order free pickup, you get the same great deals as you'd get in store. So you can save when you order during band practice or at the dog park or wherever. Start your cart with the Kroger app and save from wherever today. Kroger, fresh for everyone. $35 order minimum restrictions may apply. Subject to availability. Get more ways to save at the buy five or more, save $1 each sale. Just buy five or more participating items and save a dollar each with card. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Hey folks, welcome to the Adventure Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Mason. Uh, This episode is when we talked to Elspeth Beard back in 2017. It's a revisited episode about circumnavigating the world on motorcycle. Back in 1982, at the age of just 23 years old, she decided to drop out of architecture school, left her family, left her friends in London, and set off in a 35,000-mile solo two-year, two-and-a-half-year adventure around the world on a 1974 BMW. It was uh, due to a breakup and just, you know, limited savings with her job and just wanting to do something and to prove herself. Uh, And it ended up absolutely changing her life, just like it would you or me. Uh, She left not knowing what she'd face, not knowing anything really, and saw war zones to the most beautiful scenery to uh, civil uprisings to you know unforgiving landscapes even forcing her uh, to fake documents fending off attackers biker gangs corruption but also wonderful beautiful things and stories of people coming to her rescue and all sorts of th- things and uh, she even fell in love twice on this experience this is adventure this is why we do this show and it's these kinds of stories on the heels of heartbreak that change our lives. So if you're going through something that feels like a crossroads or something that feels very, very disruptive to your life, maybe this is adventure calling. I don't know. Don't hurt anyone. Don't hurt yourself or your future or go at it in a way that's escapism. But sometimes really good adventures start out (laughs) that way. So (laughs) maybe you should go for it. I don't know. Um, Find out what adventure you need to do and go for it. So this is the year that we want folks to actually start taking those steps. So I hope this show and I hope this episode uh, inspires you in some way. Let's go ahead and jump in. Thank you very much. Well, Elspeth, I think that that's amazing. And the reason that you're here with us today all these years later, is because you've completed a book about your experiences. And so today we're going to go back through what it was like way back at the beginning of the 1980s to journey around the planet in that social political time world, that historical point. And we also want to hear about your book and how people can, um, like I said earlier, perhaps get on the back of the motorcycle and, and ride along with you for a little while by reading your book. So Thank you very much for stepping up and sharing the story with the book and also with the Adventure Sports Podcast. But let's rewind first. Who was Elspeth Beard way back then? You were just graduating from college when this struck you, right? Yeah, well, I I started riding bikes when I was about 17. I got my first bike, um, but it really was just to to get myself around London. It was a kind of cheap and efficient way of, of getting around town. And I didn't really see myself as a, you know, as a great biker or anything. Uh, it was just a kind of means of transport. Um, and then I bought a, a 250 and that, you know, I could go a little bit further, a little bit faster. Uh, and then about a year later, I bought my BMW 600. And it was really when I bought my, my you know, my 600 that I suddenly... Uh, realized the traveling potential of a motorbike Mm. Um, so I started to do trips I did I I, I, my first trip I did was up to Scotland then I did a trip around Ireland 
Then the following year, I did a trip around Europe for about two months. And then my first big trip was um, in, 19, in the summer of 81, which is I flew out to Los Angeles and I bought myself a BMW 750. Uh, I think it was a 1973 model. So it was even older than my one I had at home. And I rode it um, from Los Angeles, uh, sort of north up up the West Coast, to, through all the northern states uh, to the East Coast. And then I sold it and flew home. So that was my first real big trip. So the sort of seed was sown to, and I, went, and I can remember thinking then, wouldn't it be amazing if I could actually ride my bike around the world? But it wasn't and really until the following year, um, in the summer of 1982, that a whole series of events kind of um, transpired to, to make me realize that actually I just wanted to go, I needed to get away, and I just wanted to escape. Wow. You know, I have to be a little bit candid with you. I grew up in a similar time frame, um, was still just kind of entering the beginning of, of high school, the end of junior high around that time period. But I remember myself being, you know, a high school student and graduating an early college student, having a real strong thirst for adventure. But I think I would have been hesitant to do something like what you did. I had a friend upon graduation, um, she went solo to France and lived for a year. And I always respected her so much for having the guts to just mm. step into a foreign country where you really don't know the language and try to make your way. And uh, I don't know, the times maybe have changed a little bit. The world is a smaller place today. More people do mm. more travel, I think, than we were able to mm. then. But I have to say, as a young lady... Let's see, you were you said you were 22 years old, is that right? I was 23 when I left. 23 so, years yes, old. So as a young lady, yeah. taking off solo on your own on a motorcycle for an around-the-world trip, um, wow, that takes guts. And I, I, it takes guts for someone today when it's more common, but I think it would take so much more um, of a sense of adventure and self-confidence to do it then. What was it that gave you the confidence to to give this a go? I think I didn't I didn't really think of it as as I'm going to ride around the world, although that was always in the back of my mind and it was always my goal and my aim to do it. I think if I'd sort of thought about it, you know, the kind of mammoth task of doing that just would have almost been too much for me to to, you know, would have frightened me too much. So I, I really did break it down into stages. And I just thought, I'll just earn what I can. So I, I worked in a pub for three months, I earned two and a half thousand pounds, which was all the money I left with. And I and having been across America the summer before, I was sort of confident that that money should be able to get me I should be able to get to either New Zealand or Australia where I could earn some more money. And that was really my, you know, the first leg of my trip. And the rest of the world, I didn't even think about it because the world was constantly changing. And, and you would, you know, you would always have to change your route or choose different countries to go through if, if, if certain countries were at war with other countries. So there was no point kind of planning the whole thing. So I really did just break it down into sort of bite-sized pieces that 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 I found easy to you know to cope with. So first of all, it was getting over to the state. Then I would get across the state. Then I got to New Zealand, and 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 it really was just doing one country at a time. And it wasn't really until I probably got all the way to Turkey after I got through through um, through Iran, and I got into Turkey. I think that was the first time I thought actually I'm going to do it. I wow. am actually going. To make it home. <laughs> That's amazing. So what about your upbringing there in the UK? Um, was there something about your childhood that gave you the, the fortitude to step out and attempt something like this? I, I think I had quite a sort of un, unconventional upbringing. My, my father was a, well, both my parents were doctors. Uh, my father was a very eccentric psychiatrist. Um, and he always used to drag us around Europe when we were 
when we were very young, he was he was sort of completely obsessional about seeing, you know, every single church altarpiece, you know, uh, castle ruin, and we would just spend our entire time being dragged all over Europe, seeing all these um, things, all all these places. So I, I suppose, you know, from a very early age, we 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 kind of always travelled as a family. And and I think because they they also had a you know they let us very much um, you know they you know they gave us you know a lot of freedom which I think was very good although it was all in a in a very carefully guided way but we were allowed to make our own mistakes in life they didn't stop us from doing things and I think that sort of I think that you know the combination of those things gave me the you know the free spirit and the you know to go off and do these things and not be afraid and also to travel and and to be interested in seeing places. Mm, that's neat. So for a lot of people that we visited with, there there's some sort of a trigger event that kind of kicked them out the door, right? Um, did you have something like that that said, "Okay, I'm doing it now. This is time." Yeah. Well, about. About uh, about three months before I was taking my finals and my uh, my, my first three years architecture, uh, while I was at, at uni, I'd I'd met and fallen madly in love with Alex, and um, and he sort of finished our relationship about three months before my final exam. So I was mm. broken hearted. I was devastated, and and that kind of combined and and I found it really hard. To, to work as well uh, because of it because I was so miserable so I, I didn't do you know very well in my degree um, and I was questioning whether I should carry on doing architecture at all so I, I was broken hearted didn't know whether I wanted to do architecture and I've been kind of riding my bike for or riding bikes for about five or six years by then and um, and sort of the seed had been sown so it all just kind of came you know together at the same you know one time and I just thought actually I'm I'm off I'm you know I'm going now's the time wow so what were your early concerns before you left um you started out in English-speaking countries but you continued on through phew, hundreds of languages I'm sure uh mm. did you have concerns about the language or the culture or the roads you know how are you going to make your way I was never worried about the language and the culture because I think you can always make yourself understood. You either draw pictures or sign language or, you know, you, you can always make yourself understood. I was worried. I was worried about my bike and being able to fix it. Um, I was worried about the roads. Um, I think I was worried about, you know, falling off my bike, you know, lying in a ditch and just basically dying because there was no... <laughs> Well, in those days, you didn't have phones. You couldn't just phone somebody up oh, and that's say, right. I've had an accident. And nobody knew where I was. Absolutely nobody knew where I was. I used to phone home once every, you know, two or three weeks if I could find a payphone. Um, so, I mean, my parents knew, obviously, which country I was in, and they knew roughly in which region I was in, but that was it. So it was, I was worried about that. And I was worried, I suppose, about being attacked, being a woman on my own. Um, so, yeah, I did have, you know, I did have worries. Wow. Did these worries postpone your trip for you or cause you enough concern to, to slow you down or make you reconsider whether or not to go? Or were you always just like, oh, I'll just take it as it comes? I was very much, I'll take it as it comes I mean I, I kind of knew I mean I think I think you can you know you just have to do your best to mentally prepare yourself for these things to happen uh, which hopefully enables you to cope better with them when they do happen um, but I I, I I try not to worry about it but I, I I mean it was something that was always in the back of my mind you know whether I, and I think it was really having accidents and falling off my bike and being injured and lying on the side of the road. That was probably my, you know, my biggest fear. Well, and we should remember that motorcycles back then were quite a lot heavier than our modern versions. Um, you can get hurt today too, don't get me wrong, but when you're talking about a 600cc 1974 BMW, I mean, that had to be a beast of a bike. 
Yeah, but actually the BMWs, the old BMWs, the, the engines are very low. They have a very low center of gravity. So they're actually quite easy to, to ride. I mean, these days, I think the bikes have a much higher, you know, the, you know, the weight is much higher. And I find modern bikes actually quite, you know, they are, you know, they feel heavier to ride than, mm. than, than my old bike. It's the center of gravity that makes the difference in how it handles. But what about picking it up if you do drop it? Was that an issue? Were you able to do that? I could do it as long as I unloaded all of the luggage. I couldn't pick, pick it up when it was fully loaded. Mm. And was that something that happened on the trip? Um, it happened It happened uh, quite a lot when I was riding through Pakistan, through the deserts in Pakistan, because there were no roads or anything. It was all just deep sand. and So, I mean, I used to fall over, I don't know, five or six times a day, but it was oh. a kind of soft, soft soft landing so and uh and i had to unload all the bike and pick it up and so um but, you know, i dropped it a few times in india i had a bad accident in australia um but generally it was it was you know you just have to cope if you have to you do well i can imagine by the fifth or sixth time in a given day that you're trying to unload the bike and pick it back up again that must have been pretty disheartening <laughs> how did that feel well it was yeah, I mean it was you know exhausting more than anything else. Um, and by that time, I'd been uh, I'd been on the road for nearly two years. I'd I'd lost you know a huge amount of weight. I'd been incredibly ill, so I was weak. I was tired, and I just kind of wanted to get home. So it, it was you know I did really need to you know draw in on my kind of real inner strength to keep going. Um, so it, it, I mean I you know it was very hard at times. Wow. Well, let's go back a little bit and uh, share with the listeners the route that you took, because I think that adds a lot to the story, gives us some context. So how did you get around the planet? Right. Well, I, first of all, I shipped my bike to, to uh, New York, uh, and I flew and picked it up two weeks later. Then I rode from New York uh, up, to, uh, uh, up into Canada and then down to uh, New Orleans, and then across through Texas, uh, New Mexico, Arizona to California, and I kind of dipped into you know Mexico for a day or two. Um, then from Los Angeles, I shipped my bike uh, straight to Sydney because I didn't have the money to ship it to New Zealand, uh, and I flew to uh, to New Zealand where I hitched around New Zealand for about six weeks while my bike was on in. in transit to sydney then i rejoined my bike in sydney i arrived in sydney with 50 dollars left that's all i had oh, in the world wow. i know i just made my money last and then i worked in sydney for um seven months i did two or three jobs and i saved six thousand uh, dollars and then i rode uh, all around australia uh, right up through queensland across uh, to the northern territory down to port augusta and then across the nullarbor to perth and then I shipped my bike directly from Perth to Singapore. And while my bike was in transit, I then travelled uh, by buses and on foot through Indonesia. So I went to Bali, Java and Sumatra. And then I rejoined my bike in Singapore. And then I rode up through Malaysia and Thailand. And I went right up to the northern parts of Thailand, up to the Golden Triangle, which is amazing. And then I couldn't get into Burma, so I then had to ride back down to Malaysia and then I shipped my bike across to uh, India to Madras and then I rode from Madras to Calcutta and then up to Kathmandu in Nepal and then I did a, a three-week trek in Nepal and then I rode back into India and rode uh, to Delhi and then when I went right up into Kashmir and Leh and Ladakh which is absolutely amazing and then I rode uh, from India into Pakistan and into Iran and then across Iran into Turkey and then all the lengths of Turkey into Greece and then Yugoslavia, um, Austria, Germany, Belgium and home. Wow. You know, so that that's quite the journey. I am amazed and impressed. But... Um, we should probably pull in the, the historical context for this as well. I mean, we're talking about you did this in the first term of Ronald Reagan. The USSR was still 
a country. The Iran hostage situation was alive and well um, just before you started your trip. So the the political times were quite different than they are today. Yeah, well, it, well, I yes, because when I was traveling through when I was traveling through Iran, it was actually the country was at war with Iraq, so that was was quite tense. There were sort of tanks in the streets and soldiers everywhere and roadblocks every 50 miles. Um, and also Russia had just invaded Afghanistan as well. So a huge amount of Afghani refugees had, had kind of come into the deserts in, you know, in Pakistan. So, so that whole region felt very, very unsafe and very, very tense. So I was, I was really relieved when I crossed the border out of Iran into Turkey, which was kind of why I felt that was the moment I felt you know, I've, I'm, uh, I've made it home. I'm now, I'm, I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm s- just so close to Europe. I've, I've made it home now. Mm. And Margaret Thatcher would have been the prime minister at the time, I suppose. She was indeed. Wow. So from an American perspective, uh, the Middle East was a, a, a hotbed at the time and not a, a place that was necessarily friendly toward people from the United States. Being from the UK, did you feel a little bit more accepted or was it pretty much the same way? It was pretty much the same way. I, I, I mean, they probably, they probably disliked us slightly less than they did. <laughs> they disliked, <laughs> <laughs> than they disliked the Americans, but I don't think there was much in it. Um, but I, I can remember when I got to the border with, uh, actually it was the border between Iran and Turkey. There was this huge sign had been painted on the wall saying no Western. Mm. And there was this another huge picture of the, of the Ayatollah all painted next to it. So it, 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 I mean, it did have quite an unfriendly, but I have to say the, the Iranian people were, were, were lovely. They couldn't have been kinder and nicer to me. Um, so it was a it was a very odd country to travel through because you sort of felt that uh, that they that they wanted to be uh, hospitable but but they were almost afraid to be in case somebody saw them. <laughs> right. Well, it seems often that it's the political situation that makes these things so tenuous, and that the people that live in these countries are just like everybody else. Exactly. People around the planet, we all have the same heart, the same desires, and the same needs. You know. So I know that you could probably tell me so much more about that than than I'll ever know. But what did you learn in interacting with people for over two years on this trip about um, humanity and how they deal with the various social economic you know circumstances they find themselves in? People around the world, we are all very much the same, and it and when it comes down to it, you know, we need shelter, we need food, and. And we and we need our families around us, and and that's you know whether you're rich or poor, or you live in a mountain or a desert, or you know whatever language you speak, it's 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 the same for everybody. Um, and I I I mean I found people around the world. Where, I mean, I mean when I left on on the trip, I kind of imagined this world was full of these these awful people who were going to be out to steal from me or attack me or whatever but actually it was it's it's it, i mean it wasn't like that at all i mean the world is full of fantastic you know helpful friendly people who you know i mean for every you know person that i met that tried to steal from me or whatever i would met uh, i would meet a hundred other people who, who who couldn't be nicer and kinder to me so you know the world is full of lovely people who you know who do uh you know as you say we are all the same when it comes down to it Hmm. yeah no doubt so do you have a story about an experience that helped you to to come to this realization somewhere along the way well i had a lot of uh as i said i i I mean i received a lot of um kindness from people i think one of the, the the incidents i had when i was riding my bike in thailand um, and I, uh, I, I was riding along and this dog kind of, kind of ran out from behind a truck and I, and I hit the dog head on and it was a big dog and I, and I was, I was knocked off my bike completely. Uh, and I slid along the road and my bike kind of ended up in a ditch and I was all, I was all bruised and, and I broke my toes and, 
and 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 I was kind of lying on the road and and this and all and, and this Thai family there was this farm right next door to where you know right next to where it had happened and this Thai family came out and they were you know and they helped me and they they they, they helped me pull my bike out of the ditch and I ended up staying with them for you know for four or five days and they were so I mean I didn't speak a word of Thai and they didn't speak a word of English um but somehow that kind of just it just didn't matter um and and we ate together and I slept with the family on, on the floor of this room and um and then on the last day the um I went into the kitchen uh just to say goodbye to the you know t- to the mother uh, and I actually saw the dog that I <laughs> that I run over that it was basically it was half eaten so we'd been eating <laughs> we'd been eating this dog for the four or five days I was there and I had absolutely no idea so but they were they were at, they were lovely to me and they gave me things they gave me presents and they were just they couldn't have been kinder <laughs> I think that a few people could claim they got quite that revenge on the animal that caused them to wreck <laughs> 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 no, I, I have to say I was really pleased because after I, I killed the dog, well, after I, I ran the dog over, I, I looked around and I couldn't see it anywhere. And I was kind of thinking, oh, my, I don't believe it. It must be dead. But of course, they'd just taken it away without me seeing. So it was only when I saw it in the kitchen sort of five, five days later. <laughs> Grab the meat first, then help the girl. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, I'm sure they <laughs> Oh, wow. That's, that's an amazing, amazing account. Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that help make this show possible. If eating healthier this new year has got you a little stressed out from the money, from the time, from the research of the recipes, well, guess what? HelloFresh is going to make it easy to eat well and save money this year. Cut back on expensive takeout and delivery and get started with HelloFresh. You'll love how fast, easy, and affordable it is to whip up a restaurant-quality meal right from your own kitchen. Just for full disclosure, I actually had a subscription of HelloFresh the last time, uh, our second baby, when it, when he was born, uh, just to take that aspect of, of getting back to life out of our hands. You know, healthy food, easy-to-cook meals arrive right at our door, and I didn't do it forever, but I, it was so helpful for the time I did. And I think it's going to be really helpful this year with wanting to eat healthier. And it came in so handy for, for that. So even if you're looking for, if someone's going through a lot or they just have a lot on their plate, maybe this is something you could gift someone too. That would be an awesome gift to someone who just had a baby or is going through something where, you know, you don't want to buy them fast food or takeout all the time, but you could get them really healthy meals delivered right to their house and they're very easy to cook and it's very satisfying to make it yourself. So if you're interested, go to HelloFresh.com slash ASP21 and use the code ASP21 for 21 free meals plus free shipping. That's crazy. Again, that's HelloFresh.com slash ASP for Adventure Sports Podcast. 21 and use the code ASP21 for 21 free meals plus shipping. Holy cow. That's a great deal. Check it out yourself. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. You know, I guess I have to just wonder, when you go all the way around the planet and you have thousands of different experiences with people, it has to enrich your life in a way. Um, has it just become a huge part of who you are and who you turned out to be later in life? Yes, I think so. I mean, I think the trip very much shaped me for the rest of my life. I think, you know, you learn... You know, you just learn so much about about people, about how to how to how to deal with 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 with, with different people and situations, you know, good and bad. You you know, you learn to read people quite quite well. You know, it, it's just it, it just equips you to to sort of deal with with life. Um, it, 
it's 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 hard to explain but for sort of me it gave me a kind of real sort of inner strength and confidence you know I, I felt when I got back from my trip that I could do absolutely anything there wasn't anything I couldn't do there wasn't a problem I couldn't tackle there wasn't there wasn't a problem I couldn't deal with you know I would never take no for an answer if somebody said you can't do this I would just say there has to be a way and I think it, it was it, it was that that I learned on the trip and a lot of my a lot of my work you know the projects that I do I always seem to end up with the really complicated challenging projects in my office and I think it's it's which actually I really like because it keeps you it kind of keeps you focused and keeps you uh, it just keeps that edge going, and I think that's really important. And and I, you know, I, I never like to do projects the same way. I always like to approach things in different ways. And and I think that all came from my trip. I, I sort of learned ha- how to do that, and I think that's a real asset. Oh yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So you mentioned that before your trip, you were you weren't sure if you wanted to go into architecture anymore. You had your degree, and you were like, I don't know if I even want to do this. So when you came back. Um, were you ready then to dive into the career? Well, it, it, interestingly, the trip also made me realize that I, because d- during the trip, architecture suddenly made made sense to me as well. Um, because when I was doing my 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 uh, degree, I, I never really, I mean, I, I I sort of got it, but I didn't. It, it didn't really click for me, and. It was really when I was traveling and it was when I was in Australia, actually, and I was working in Australia and I, and I went to the building site for the first time and I saw all these plans that I'd been drawing for months and months in the office, all kind of appearing out of the ground. And it was just amazing. And suddenly I kind of understood what architecture was all about. And... um and I think also traveling through all the countries and seeing all, all the amazing different buildings and cultures and, 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 and how climate affects the, the, you know, the way they build and the way they live. It, it just all sort of started to make sense. So the trip really helped me understand architecture. So when I came back to this country, uh, I, I was, you know, I was very keen to, you know, as I say, I suddenly understood what it was all about. Hmm, that's neat. I love it how a life experience like this can enrich us in ways we may not expect, right? And maybe that's one you did expect, or maybe not. But I don't know that a lot of people would expect that. I didn't expect it at all. I mean, when I left on my trip, I thought, actually, I can't see me ever going back to do architecture. But it was just an interest that that evolved while I was traveling, because I saw some incredible buildings. Uh, and, uh, And because of, you know, my 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 early childhood had been dragged around Europe and being forced to see every single church, right. uh, castle, <laughs> ruin. I made sure that when I was traveling through, I saw everything that I could possibly see. Um, so, you know, and I and I almost became quite quite you know obsessive about it, sort of. Um, but it was you know it was great. It was it was you know it really, you say you know it gave me a lot. Oh, that's neat. Yeah, and that's one that I wouldn't have necessarily thought of, but I think it's so cool how that ties into the rest of your life. That's really neat. So how has mm. the world changed? You know, we talked about it being, you know, the beginning of the Reagan years and, and the social economic world was so different then. But from your perspective, having done this trip at that time, how do you think the world is different today? I think I think the main, I, I think the real change is, is, the, is all the inf- information that's out there i think i think that the internet mobile phones all that technology has completely transformed the world and also it's 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 completely transformed the way people think about traveling the world i think um you know and and it's a double-edged sword i think in some ways it's really good because it gives it gives people uh, a degree of comfort so they sort of feel they know where they they're going they can get an idea of where they're going to be staying they can plan it they can book it they can do all that and that makes and that encourages a lot more more people to travel which of which of course is a good thing 
But on the other side of it, I think it does take a lot of the sort of adventure and the unknown, uh, uh, you know, away from it. I mean, I had no idea when I set off in the morning. I had no idea where I was going to be that evening. I had no idea what I was going to encounter. I had no idea what the roads were going to be like, where I was going to get petrol, where I was going to be able to buy food, where I was going to be staying. And, and so you do live for the moment and it's very intense. Um, and I think you, you learn to live on your wits as well because you have to, because you don't, you can't find anything out. You, you, you just have to, you, you just have to deal with, 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 um, you know, with, with what you find all the time. And I think, I, I think that does give you a, you know, that does give you a, a sort of strength that, that I think all this technology, in some ways just makes it a bit too easy now but mm. as i said it's it's you know it's it's a, it's a it's a you know well i i find it fascinating to even think about just navigation uh most people these days say well i've got the gps here are the roads i see them i see where i am on the road i'm exactly 1.2 miles from my next turn i'm going to turn left and that's going to lead me to you didn't have any of that how did you find your way around yeah, but- the planet <laughs> Yeah, but isn't that boring? Isn't it, isn't it more fun just to say, right, let's the, you know, the sun's on my, you know, right hand side and I want to travel north or south, depending on which, you know, uh, and you just, you just have to follow your nose and you just end up where you end up. I mean, in most countries, I could get vague sort of maps. Um, I mean, in Thailand, I struggled uh, to because all of the road signs were actually written in Thai script. Mm. So um, I, I had to find a map. It took me three or four days uh, walking around the streets of Bangkok to actually find a map that had uh, all the um, all the towns written in Thai script and in English. So I actually knew that you know, you know, like a um, a dot and a squiggle and three dots and three more squiggles was, you know, was was Chiang Mai. And then every time I came to like a sign on a road sign, I have to stop and match all the squiggles up so I would find my way. <laughs> so it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, you just become quite, you know, inventive, I suppose. And you just, you, you know, you just cope with what you have to cope with. Yeah. And, you know, as I've been raising my own children, I don't let them rely on GPS too much. I want them to have the map and I want them to sort out how they're going to get somewhere before they start instead of just following, you know, Google Maps telling them to turn left or right. I think that's important for us to get context for where we are and to understand the world around us. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. I love maps. I mean, I, I, I do actually have a GPS, but I also have a map in my car still because I like to know where I am in, 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 you know, in relation to everything else. And I like to... I just love maps. You, you, you know, you can't beat a map, and it's always it it, it will always work. <laughs> right. You can always rely on it, and um, you know, it's it's it's, and I I think a lot is lost. And if you, and also I think you know, if you if you get lost, is that that's part of the that's part of the journey is getting lost. You know, you can't kind of find yourself unless you lose yourself. And I think. You know, and if you get lost and you and you have to stop and ask a local the way, and then you end up having a c- cup of tea with them, and then they end up inviting you to, you know, in to, to have you know an evening meal with their family, and those are the experiences. That's the that's the journey. Uh, it's not following a red line on a screen. Right. And you don't have those experiences if you if you're following this this red line that takes you right to the door of your hotel, which you've booked three nights beforehand. Yeah, Elspeth, I totally get that. Do you think that it's harder to fly by the seat of your pants, so to speak, these days? And the reason I ask is because of the internet, people pre-book everything. So when you get to Mm. that next town, can you even find a place these days? Well, that is true. And I think it's, you know, I think now I, I, you know, I often say to people, if you travel, just, just don't, just, just don't take any gadgets with you. If if you want to take a, a mobile phone, take a really basic old phone just to use in an emergency and that's it. But I think, I think you're right. The problem is now that everybody uses the internet, everybody books anything. And if you arrive in places, you, you know, you won't find anywhere to stay because it's all been pre-booked by everybody. 
So, I mean, you almost, you can't, it's almost uh, impossible now to go back and travel the way that I traveled. Mm. Well, the world has changed, no doubt about it. The world has changed. So your publisher told me that you had some hardships along the way. And I think that no story is complete until we share the tough times too. So would you tell us a, a story or two about some of the hardships that you encountered? Yeah, I mean, one of the, I, th I think my first big accident, which was in uh, the outback in Australia, that was, um, I, I was fortunately about three days before my accident, I'd actually met up with these two guys who were riding uh, on one bike. One was a Kiwi uh, and uh, one was uh, a guy from the UK who had gone out to uh, Australia, bought a bike in Sydney and he was just riding um, around um, around Australia. And uh, so fortunately, I met with them um, and I was riding. We were riding on a really bad dirt road in the outback in Queensland um, and I was ahead and my front wheel uh, went into a, into a huge pothole. Uh, and because I had so much weight on the back of the bike, the whole of the back of the bike flipped over and I basically I cartwheeled the bike down the road oh. and I landed on I know and I landed on my head uh, and I had a huge gouge kind of out of the side of my my helmet um and i was concussed uh, and i don't remember anything about the accident so i'm relying completely on what tom and ewan told me happened because <laughs> my memory is completely wiped out even to this day i have no recollection uh, of what uh, of what happened and i all i can remember was, was waking up in hospital uh, and the ambulance had to come 180 miles to pick me up um and and I was I was in hospital for about uh, seven to ten days I think, kind of recovering and I was all kind of bruised and whatever. But it was and then I had to go through the whole thing of you know getting my bike repaired and so it was so that was that was pretty tough. Um, and I think hitting the dog in Thailand, although that was you know I was lucky to to be t taken in by this lovely family. Um, you know, I was very beaten up and bruised, uh, and my, you know, and riding the bike after that, um, after both of the accidents was really hard because, you know, I was so sore and my hands ached and my, and when in Thailand I'd broken my toe, so it was very hard for me to change gear. Um, and I think the other probably the other really tough time was when I was riding through uh, through through Iran. Um, because I was only given a seven day transit visa. So I had to do a lot of miles in seven days. Uh, and right in the middle of it, I got hepatitis. Oh, no. Um, so, so I literally, I had to, fortunately, I'd, I'd met this Dutch guy, uh, Robert, uh, in Kathmandu. So we were traveling together through, through um, Iran. And, uh, I mean, it was just such an effort to, you know, to do anything. I could barely walk. I was so weak. But because we had this seven day, uh, you know, restriction, we had to get out of the country in seven days. I had no choice, but I had to ride my bike. And Robert would, he would carry me down the stairs and he would put me on my bike um, and he would literally push me off. And I would just pray all day that I wouldn't have to stop, you know, that, that the lights would change before I got to them because I just didn't have the strength to. to and we stopped at a petrol station uh, several times um, and I put my, you know, my legs down to steady the bike and I, that there was just no strength in them. And I, I, and I just rolled over. And I was oh. lying in the forecourt with my bike on top of me because I just didn't have the strength in my legs. So, so that was really tough. Being ill, I hated being ill. You know, when you're ill and it's and it's forty degrees, and you and you and you have to ride. It's, I mean, it's fine if you can hold up somewhere for, you know, for a week or two and you know and recuperate. But, but in Iran, we just didn't have that choice. I had to ride. So I was riding three four hundred miles a day with hepatitis in Iran. You know, and there were these bloody roadblocks all the time, and it was just, it, you know, and I'd been on the road for two years. I was tired by then. Oh yeah. So it, it, the whole thing. So that was a that was a pretty grim time. Wow, wow. I I've never heard of someone trying to ride a motorcycle with hepatitis in those conditions. I can't imagine how you got through that. Did you just want to give up? At, was there a point at which you thought, well, you know what, there's got to be an airport somewhere I could go home? Yeah, but that. 
But that's the difference as well, which people don't realise. In those days, you couldn't leave your bike and fly home. Your bike was written into your passport. So you had to exit the country with your bike. And so it wasn't an option in those days. And I know now a lot of people do these round the world trips and, and, you know, and they'll, and they'll do a little trip and then they'll leave their bike somewhere and they'll fly home for a bit of R and R and then they'll fly out again and do a little bit more as a trip. That wasn't an option when I did it. You had to leave every country with your motorbike. And in those days you couldn't fly motorbikes. So the only option I had was to sit and ride it. There was, there was no other option. Mm. And I think when you've got that in your mind, and I think this is, the, this is the other thing. When you have those thoughts in your mind, it really focuses you because you, you don't have all these, these routes that you can escape. Oh, I'll just do this. Oh, I'll just fly home. Oh, I'll just phone somebody out. Oh, I'll just ha- have a look at, at the internet. You just didn't have those options. And the only option you had was to, was to do it yourself and get on the bike and ride it. Wow. That's quite the commitment. And I guess, you well, know, that maybe that's where some of the fortitude comes from. But I still think that you must be a very powerful, strong woman. <laughs> I'm convinced. <laughs> I'm very determined. <laughs> when, I set myself a, when I set myself a challenge, there's not a lot that will stop me. Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that help make this show possible. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. Well, let's talk about your book, Elspeth. I mean, you've recounted so much about your trip, and I'm thoroughly enjoying this, but you wrote a book about it so that people can, like I said, ride along with you. The name of the book is Lone Rider, and uh, tell us about the book. Well, it, it's it, it's um, it's taken me two and a half years to write it. Uh, when I got back from my trip in 1984, um, Nobody was interested in what I'd done at all. And I think it was partly because because people didn't travel that much in those days. And people certainly didn't do around the world motorbike trips in those days. Um, All my friends and family and well, everybody just found it really hard to, you know, to actually relate to. They couldn't understand what I'd been through. They didn't. And it was almost easier to pretend that I hadn't done it. Wow. So I felt. I felt incredibly lonely and isolated when I got back. And it took me, you know, at least two years to, you know, to, you know, just to start to, you know, to get back into, you know, living in a Western country and just 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 being able to talk to people. Um, So it was a very isolating experience. And I think and although I had sort of wanted to write a book when I got back, I I you know, because nobody was interested, I just packed all my my tapes, my because I used to send these tapes home and my diaries, my photographs, or my letters. I just put them all in a in a cardboard box and I threw threw them in the back of a cupboard, which is where they sat for thirty years. And then in two thousand and eight, uh, a friend of mine, a journalist, was asked by BMW International to uh to write a short article about my story so he he wrote the article and it was put online and then gradually you know my story spread over the next seven or eight years on the internet um and uh and then in 2015 um an agent in hollywood contacted me uh wanting to buy the rights to my story to make a film so this was completely out of the blue. And um, so I, they flew me out to Los Angeles and I was you know, limousined around, which was amazing. And, uh, and I went to see producers and, and script writers. And, but I think it was that because I hadn't actually looked at any of my diaries and it was 34 years ago. So right. half of the story, I, could, I couldn't even remember. So um, I, I, it was really after after that I thought actually I I think it's really important that I that I I write a book first so there's an accurate um, story um, you know of my trip and also there seemed to be a lot more interest now people actually wanted to hear about what I'd done so it was really that that spurred me on to you know to actually sit down and start writing the book. Well. Has the book already been launched 
on society, or are we still looking forward to the publication date? No, it was published last week. On last the 6th of week. July. Very yeah, good. Perfect timing. That's great. <laughs> so how can people um, get a copy of the book? I, I think in America, it's probably uh, the best. You, you can order it online um, through the book depository. And they, they ship worldwide for free. So uh, you can get it online and they will ship worldwide for free. Uh, I think my publisher at the moment is trying to find a publisher in America uh, to, you know, to publish it over there. But because it's all fairly new at the moment, um, I think they're in discussions with, with, with some U.S. publishers. So The book uh, depository. The, the book depository. Uh, and as I say, they ship worldwide for free. Okay, so that's fun. Is there a soft copy of the book, a Kindle version or something? There is a Kindle version, which can be downloaded, indeed, which is also, I think you can get it on Amazon or, um, yeah, well, Amazon UK, but I think you can get that anywhere. I, I think you can download load the Kindle. So if someone goes to Amazon and searches for Lone Rider by Elspeth Beard, they should be able to find a soft copy that they can read on their Kindle. That would be cool. They should. They should, indeed. So what is the flavor of the book? How would you describe it? Is it a, a kind of a, a summary of all your journaling? Or is it more of a how-to guide? Or is it more of the inward struggles that you went through on the journey? What, what, how would you categorize it? It's, it's, it's really my journey. Uh, it's, it's my loves. My, my, I, I, I fell in, in and out of love with three different men a, a, along the journey. It's how I coped with everything. Uh, I'd say it's a very honest book. Um, it's kind of, it's got all, all the good and the bad in it. Uh, I haven't, I didn't, uh, I didn't want to leave anything out. Um, I've been, I mean, somebody described it as, you, you know, you call it, you know, you definitely call a spade a spade. And I think, um, it is a very honest account of, of my journey, the people I met. And and my my you know emotions and how I how I grew and and what I learned from the trip. Mm. Well, it sounds like a fascinating read. Really, really does. I, I uh, I'm going to have to grab a copy of it. The problem that I have, Elspeth, is that I interview so many people with so many great books, I can't keep up. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to read yours. It sounds delightful. It really does. So, Lone Rider by Elspeth Beard. So, Elspeth, I have to ask, you know, you've had a lot of years to reflect back on this journey and to process what, you know, what happened and how it impacted your life. Would you recommend it to young people these days to do something similar? Absolutely. I think traveling is just, it's one of those great things in life that, you know, the the experiences you 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 know you you encounter you you just can't do it any any other way traveling seeing the world seeing how other people live and other people's cultures is so important and it's it's really important so we all you know have a better understanding of each other um so i would i, I couldn't recommend it highly enough definitely everybody should travel as much as they can. And if they can do a round-the-world bike trip, even better. Do you think the motorcycle is the right way to do it? Is it the best mode of travel? I think, I mean, for me, it definitely was. Uh, it gave me the freedom. I could travel where I wanted. I wasn't reliant on buses or public transport. But then on the, you know, on the you know negative side, you know, you have this, 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 you know, piece of machinery which you have to look after you have to maintain you have to be you know so it's it's you know i mean there's no perfect way to do it i think it's just a, it's a personal thing how you choose to travel hmm. i've heard a lot of people seeing the the glories of the bicycle because it's slower and it's quieter and they say that the bicycle really opens up a lot of social interactions because people always want to know did you really ride that thing all the way here you know I think that a motorcycle can do that too. Did it? Did it have that impact? A bit. I, I think. I think that's probably. I mean, I think the problem with a motorbike is is that you are wearing a helmet, and that instantly uh, creates a barrier between you and 
whoever you're, you know, meeting or talking to. And when I was riding my bike, I mean, I, I always wore a full face helmet and, and I did that on purpose so people actually couldn't see that I was a woman. Mm. So I didn't advertise the fact I was a woman. And so I very much sort of, um, you know, I wasn't, I, I probably didn't look that, that in, inviting to people because I didn't really want to draw much attention or a, to myself so right but that's because I was I was traveling alone and you know it was the same. it was a different time then so but I certainly think you know cycling would be uh, probably an amazing way to do it yeah I don't doubt it so any recommendations for especially young women who have an interest in travel what should they do now Oh, my goodness. Um, well, I think they should um, sort of work out what parts of the world they, they're, you know, they'd be interested. I mean, they, you know, whether it's Southeast Asia or South America. Um, and I think it's important not to not to kind of go to countries where you instantly feel they're safe, because then that's not really, you know, I think it's good to test yourself and push yourself. Um so, and I think you just just go out and have an adventure and see the world. So you just have to do it, but maybe take a few baby steps first. Yeah, exactly. Just work up to it gradually. Get 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 your confidence. Anybody can do it. The hard I always say the hardest thing is actually leaving. Once you leave on on the trip and you're and you're on the road, you know, and and you just realize what an amazing time you're having and all the the incredible experiences that you're having that you can't really get in any other way. Mm, Really, really neat. You know, I have to quote you something that you said earlier in the show. As we wrap this up, I loved what you said. You can't find yourself until you lose yourself. Mm. And that to me is a lot of what life is really about. We have to step out the door and get a little bit lost so that so that we can be found again um what does that mean to you yeah but it's the thing is people are i I find now that people are just afraid to be lost they're afraid to get lost but being lost is 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 an amazing it's it's because you really it's only when you push yourself to the absolute limit and edge do you do you know what you're capable of? And and once you've done it once, then it, it's not nearly so scary doing it the next time and then the next time. And then after a while, you don't worry about it at all. Hmm. So it's, it's, it's just, you just have to be brave and you just have to get out there and, and you know, and just do it. Yeah. Yeah. I, t- I totally agree. Wise words, and Elspeth, that's coming from someone who lived it in a totally different time that, uh, you know, you're recounting to us today what it's like. It's a, it's a beautiful story that you have, and I say bravo to you for doing it. I can't imagine um, what it must have been like when you did this to step out the door and to take off and, and to accomplish what you accomplished. It's just an amazing journey and an amazing story for me. Thank you. Oh, you bet. And thank you very much for your time on the Adventure Sports Podcast today. We love it that you shared our story specifically with us. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Oh, yeah. You're welcome. And for all of our listeners out there, the book is Lone Rider. The writer is Elspeth Beard. And remember, until the next show, get out there. Have some fun. First of all, Thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun.